Pondicherry's history began in 1673, when the French East India Company bought the Sultan a small fishing village situated in the Bay of Bengal. Since the beginning of the 16th century, Indians had been trading with many European merchants. The French decided to disembark on the southeast of the Indian subcontinent. The area was not ideal for sailing. Boats had to anchor offshore, and their crew had to use smaller local boats to transfer their goods to shore. However, the river provided access further into the country, which allowed business to develop considerably over the years. Pondicherry then became France's anchoring point in India. More than three centuries later, Pondicherry still has a strong connection with France. The street names and period villas are a unique legacy, directly inherited from its colonial past. Thanks to the mixing of the two cultures, Pondicherry remains a unique city within the Indian landscape. As the first Francophone Indian boarding school, this school is part of the history of France's trading post in Pondicherry. India is my country. All Indians are my brothers and sisters. I love my country. I am proud of its diverse wealth and its great progress. I will respect my parents and my teachers. I will be kind to animals. Break! This building was founded at the beginning of the 19th century by the Viscount of Richmond and was given to the Indian government on the condition that it would accommodate underprivileged children, something that has not changed. They teach Tamil and French here. From nursery school to high school. Saved from demolition in 1984, it is now a listed building. Thanks to Ashok Panda and his association. This is one of those unique buildings which still retains almost the identical character as it was built. Very little has changed, even though it is a school today. And this building is one of the most beautiful places and spot in the French part of the town. So the courtyard, the portico, the area close to the beach road, this is the essence of buildings that you will see, especially on this road. Ever since the establishment of the trading post in the 17th century, the city of Pondicherry has kept its dual French and Indian identity. Leo lived in France for many years, where he made his career in the army and specialized in military equestrian sports. He returned to Pondicherry in 2011. Compared with other Indian cities, Pondicherry is considered to be French. There is an old saying that in Pondicherry, even if the law isn't, the streets are straight, they are pulled by a rope and are all perpendicular. Since its very earliest days, Pondicherry's two districts have been separated by a canal. The French colonial city is in the south, and the local Tamil community live in the north. This house is typical of the historic Tamil district. It was built in 1865 and is a perfect example of Franco-Tamil architecture. The first floor has a French influence, and the ground floor is typically Tamil. For instance, its veranda. 
This space opens onto the road. Neighbours, locals and families can use it to spend time together and chat. These streets are called streets that talk. One important man in the history of Pondicherry is Joseph Francois Duplex. He was appointed as governor of all French Indian colonies in 1742. On his second visit to the country, he decided to expand the trading post's business. Duplex had heard about a merchant who could help further his ambitions. It was opposite the city's large market that they met each other for the first time. It's hard to imagine that behind this facade hides the villa of one of Pondicherry's most eminent figures. We're in the home of Ananda Ranga Pillai, whose statue sits prominently in the middle of the room. Ananda Ranga Pillai was initially only a merchant. When Dupley wanted to establish the French Empire in India, he took him into confidence and he developed political networks. Ananda Ranga Pillai was appointed as a Dubash by the French company, particularly Dupley, who knew that he was a shrewd businessman. He was a mediator, an intermediary, and he opened the letters, he read, translated, and sent the message to the lords. Thanks to Ananda Ranga Pillai's network, Duplex was able to build up a relationship of trust with the rulers of the region, and over the years, the two men became very close. Even very many kings were jealous about the relationship that was going on between Ananda Ranga Pillai and Duplex. They were thick friends. Even Duplay would not trust his own counsellors of the Superior Council of Pondicherry, but he trusted Ananda Ranga Pillai. As a testament to this friendship, these coat of arms have been placed all over the villa. The Lili and Saint Malo merchant's coat of arms are military emblems, as well as a tribute to the flourishing trade between France and India. Ananda Ranga Pillai and Joseph Francois Duplex encouraged the arrival of many craftsmen from wood sculptors to goldsmiths and weavers. These colourful and lavishly embroidered textiles were made in Chennai, formerly Madras, and were transported by the boatload to Europe, where they are known as Indien. Thanks to the alliances formed with the region's rulers, Pondicherry's was able to extend its influence as a trading post over the whole of South India. That is a huge area, almost twice the size of France. These alliances opened a very lucrative door in terms of trade in luxury woods. The most highly prized wood was sandalwood. The French India East Company used it as a type of currency. The Western Ghats are home to the country's last remaining sandalwood forest. This chain of mountains runs along the west coast of India, covering 1,600 kilometers, and has been classified as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Considered a royal tree since 1792, sandalwood has often been trafficked out of these forests. Go on, cut it there. 
Maria, ah. The Indian government now controls the use of sandalwood. A team of rangers watches over this incredible heritage site. Because here, only dead trees can be taken away. Sandalwood is the most precious and valuable tree in the world. So we are not leaving the roots, or even a single piece here in the field. So from root stage to the tip, we are taking it to the uh, dip out. Since it's become endangered, sandalwood with its unique scent has become as valuable as gold. That is why each part of the tree is treasured, even the sawdust. Surely I can smell it. No other tree or no other thing has the same smell. So uh, I don't know how to explain that. But it is unique and specific. Once the bark has been taken away, they use the tree's core for perfumes, cosmetics, drugs, and sandalwood paste. In India, this paste is a religious symbol. It is made at the Villianur Temple in Pondicherry. Built more than seven centuries ago, it is one of the oldest in the city. Every evening, an ancestral ritual takes place, dedicated to the god Shiva. Patachri has been making this famous paste for 25 years. He does so by rubbing water onto a piece of sandalwood. You have to make sandalwood paste and present it to God as it is. If another person touches it, you have to clean it and start again completely. Nobody else can touch it. Sandalwood paste is used in all stages of the Hindu religion, from birth to death. When you place the paste on the forehead and body of a god, it refreshes them. With this freshness of spirit, the god will be willing to do good things for the people. If you give sandalwood to infertile women, they will have a baby the following year. This child will then be called Santan Bakyam, which means sandalwood fortune. You may only use the middle finger of your right hand to present it to God. You can't just use any finger. Worn on the forehead, Sandalwood paste is supposed to awaken the conscious and spiritual consciousness, just as with Ganesh, the Hindu elephant god. In Hinduism, Indians revere thousands of different gods. But Ganesh is still the most popular. He is traditionally portrayed with four arms and an elephant head. He is believed to embody knowledge and virtue. Considered to be a living Ganesh, Lakshmi is almost an idol in Pondicherry. Pour some water on yourself. Go on, take some water. Just as with all Hindu deities, Lakshmi's body must be washed every day, following a very strict ritual. Sit down, sit down. Go on, sit down, old girl. Lakshmi. 
It was thanks to her white nails that Lakshmi was chosen out of several other elephants to guard the Pondicherry temple. For 19 years, her keepers have given her a two-hour bath and Ayurvedic massages every day at sunrise. They take the amount of care that is fit for her elephant god status. Lakshmi is then decorated with religious symbols and patterns. The elephant keeper is at times her master, at others her guide, and also her carer. Come on, this way. We have been looking after elephants for four generations. First, it was my grandfather, who was there at the time of the kings. Then it was my father, and now it's us. It gives us great satisfaction. We are happy to do it. Being able to control such a large animal and to receive affection in return is a tremendous feeling. We see it as a privilege that not many people have. Due to her elephant god status, Lakshmi has the right to wear sandalwood paste on her forehead. If you look at her face, you will see Ganesh's beauty. We think of her as a living Ganesh, the spirit of Ganesh, which is why she guards the temple. In all temples, elephants are considered the most important deity. Come on this way. The elephant then walks through Pondicherry. Lakshmi earns even more respect because she has the name of a Hindu goddess. Every day, Lakshmi comes and settles at the Ganesh temple entrance. Ganesh is the most revered god in India. In the Hindu religion, this elephant with a human body is considered to be the goddess of money, prosperity and education. Many students come to be blessed by her. In exchange for an offering, Lakshmi places her trunk on the heads of all those who seek her blessing. Not so far away, at the heart of the Tamil district, the atmosphere is very different. We are at the Sacre Coeur de Jesus Church. Since the 17th century, Jesuits here have been trying to convert the population of which the majority are Hindu. Indian society is divided into hierarchical groups, known as castes. The church is used to mainly accommodate people that didn't belong to a caste, those who are referred to as untouchables to this day. They used to come to the church to be baptized and to forget about their lowly status. We meet Leo. He comes here every Sunday. 
The untouchables converted because it gave them the right to work for the French administration. They lost their status as subjects and became French citizens. As such, they had the same rights as French people. In Pondicherry, it is quite normal to practice several religions. For me, for example, I've lived here since I was a child. Four or five generations before me, my family was Hindu, so I still go to temples and participate in rituals. So for me, nothing has changed. I'm Hindu, Catholic, Muslim, and I travel to the most important places in Islam, and I return to the mosque and meditate. Pondicherry is a unique city in India, thanks to the numerous influences that have shaped its culture. In 1750, the trading post was flourishing. But this growing power provoked jealousy in England. The British launched an attack on French territories. 16 vessels and 15,000 men took part in the siege of Pondicherry. In 1761, the city fell into the hands of the English. The French colonial district was completely razed to the ground. This particular hotel is the only survivor of the destruction of the French district in the 18th century. It was built by a member of the Superior Council of the French East India Company. It reflects all of the French sophistication and savoir-vivre of the trading post era. But the company could not continue like this. The hostilities between the French and English required enormous amounts of money. In October 1754, Duplex was called back to France, thus putting an end to his dream of building an Indian France. However, the relationship between Pondicherry and France is still very strong. Thousands of Tamil volunteers fought on French battlefields in the 20th century. In 1960, Nehru, the Prime Minister of a now independent India met with Charles de Gaulle in Paris. Together, they negotiated the restitution of territories that the French had acquired three centuries previously. On the 16th of August 1962, the Treaty of Session came into effect. On that very day, at the consulate, the French people of Pondicherry had until midnight to choose between an Indian or French nationality. The manager of the Alliance Francaise remembers it well. It all happened here. I remember it well. I was only young, about nine years old. People started to form a queue. So bit by bit, there were five people. Then there were 10, then 15. At midnight on the 16th of August, 1962, there was a whole crowd. The people of Pondicherry had to choose between the land they were born in and France, whose culture they had only been acquainted with for three centuries. Almost 5,000 citizens of Pondicherry, or about 10% of the population, chose to take French nationality. When I was small, I only had one wish, to go to France. Every time I saw a plane, I would think, will I ever get the chance to fly in a plane to France? For the people of Pondicherry, France is our second home. Today, 
There are still 5,000 citizens in Pondicherry who have French nationality. Centuries pass by, but as evidenced by Duplex's statue, Pondicherry is still the most French city in India.